Okay, well, uh, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to this webinar, To Be Agile or Not To Be. That is not the question. Um, before we start, I'd like to run through some, uh, some housekeeping. Please be aware that this webinar is, is being recorded and you're in listen-only mode. Um, the session will last for approximately 60 minutes, consisting of 30 to 45 minutes of knowledge share, concluding with a question and answer session. Please submit your questions via the chat uh, or questions panel during the webinar for us to address the end. Following the webinar, the recording will be uploaded into uh, the APM YouTube account and the slides will be published on the APM SlideShare uh, account, both of which will be listed on the branch community page on the APM website. Um, this normally takes up to five working days, so please, uh, please allow a few days for this for us to upload it. Um, and finally, the session will count towards your CPD. Um, so without further ado, I'd like to introduce who is going to present today. We've got, uh, we're joined by three people today, uh, Peter Falks, Natalie Lasso Stoner, and Alan Crilly, all from Scottish Water. Um, if I start with Peter, uh, Peter Falks is a, a leader in asset management transformation within Scottish Water. Um, a civil engineer with 22 years experience, he's an avid promoter of Agile principles, initially in his own team and then uh, in the wider business context. He's proven that Agile principles do make a difference to how people think, react and support each other and how the outcomes are of more value. These principles have now been applied to design and construction pro projects with the pilot delivering results more quickly on budget and with the experienced team loving the new approach. Natalie comes from a business analysis and leadership background, nurturing agile culture and capabilities within organizations such as tertiary education, professional, sorry, professional business regulation and commercial packaging. More recently contracting as a scrum master for Scottish Water. This has and continues to be an exciting and challenging agile culture growth for a very customer value driven client. And last but not least, then uh, Alan Crilly, who has over 20 years experience in the water industry as an asset management specialist. Alan is a, a relatively recent convert to Agile. Um, he says that his uh, penny drop moment came when the mindset move was from doing to being Agile. This allowed the alignment of his strategic thinking around Scottish Water's asset management and um, that uh, the Agile practices could deliver the products needed for its success. So without further ado, it gives me great pleasure to hand over to you, Peter. Okay, thank you, Jonathan, and thanks everybody for joining us. Uh, I hope you're all pondering uh, whether to be Agile or not to be. Um, some of you may be wondering whether it's uh, worth the risk, uh, I suspect some of you have made that decision a while ago and you're keen to hear a different perspective. Uh, I even wonder if some of you tried it and it didn't work and that's why you're, you're joining us today. But I'm going to share some of my story I am, and I hope it helps you. I'm not a leading consultant in introducing Agile into the business, but I am a, I am a leader who's worked at Scottish Water for over 20 years. I'm somebody who's passionate about finding better ways for my colleagues to work together. And uh, I'm also somebody who feels that, that vulnerability, that when you propose a new idea, you know that it might not work, it might fail, and it's gonna be embarrassing. Um, but I am a leader who has seeded ideas on agility for about six years now, and I feel like it's okay to admit some success and to share it with this open audience here. Now for your part, uh, this afternoon, I would like to take a piece of paper and write down three questions. What one thing have you learned from what we share today? What one thing did you already know but really resonated with you? And what one thing did you disagree with? And I do hope you find something for all three and maybe you can share it in the chat later on or you can email your thoughts to me. So, what triggers the adoption of Agile. When I started my role six years ago, my manager's manager uh, sent me a challenge. I was about to lead the delivery of our rolling program of business change. And Mary Ann said that as a business, we hadn't consistently been able to deliver the benefits. Peter, 
how are you going to make sure that the changes you make will be embedded? How are you going to ensure that the outcomes will be swiftly realized? And how are you going to ensure that, that the team who's delivering the change doesn't have the burnout towards the end of the project that we often see? And I pondered these questions deeply and a, a plan began to form. And over the next few days of frenzied research, I, I came up with a five-year plan on how to make the business agile. Of course, there was no plan. <laughs> that story is largely fictitious. Um, we didn't have a multi-step plan on how to make us agile. There was no frenzied research. That's, that's not how it came about. And I haven't spent the last five years trying to follow a sequence plan on how to make us agile. But Mary Ann's question on embedding change was there. I am, and one of, my, one of the, the contractors on the team encouraged me to look at agile thinking. And I knew quite a bit about lean and it really made sense to me. And so we began our journey. We learned, we adapted, we applied it. Um, and here we are telling our tale with a, a sense of pride. So yes, we now know how to embed business change effectively using Agile. We know how to do it in a reasonable time frame. We know how to do it without a mad panic at the end. Now, I do believe there is a way to roll out Agile quickly and methodically across all your projects in a short period of time. But I, I cannot tell you that story. I can tell you how we grew it gradually. I am um, into something that really did start to deliver, that did begin to get noticed, and is now setting us up for a really tremendous future going forward. And maybe that's similar to where you are, you know, looking to grow agile from where you are right now. Um, so you've got to ask the question, what's your trigger that's going to get you started on that journey? So you want to be agile. Well, what is it? Um, I hope you've already got some appreciation of this. It wasn't my intention to spend too long explaining what Agile is, but to me it's about helping a group of people come together to focus on a goal to really deliver great value for the customer. And in doing so, you're going to have to adapt and learn from the environment around you as it changes. You know, it's that buzz of working together, you know, with a real focus and seeing someone delighted with what you've done at the end. It's it's a great set of principles. It's a great way of being and thinking about work. And there's many frameworks out there that can help us achieve it much quicker and to a higher standard. Now, I thought I'd explain um, the framework that we most often use, which is Scrum, uh, so they all get a sense of what it's like to be in the team. And we start with this, with our planning stage, um, where we draw from the list of prioritized work and the team agree how much work can they do over the next two weeks and we set ourselves the goal. And then over the next couple of weeks, um, we work together to get those tasks done. And so we have this 15 minute daily call where we focus on achieving the goal, we plan out our day, we seek some help, and we collectively work together until we get to that point where we've got a review meeting. And we gather all our users and our key stakeholders together and we show them what we've built. And hopefully it's something which adds value to them and we receive their feedback and that helps us to learn and adapt on what we're going to do next. Um, we may release some of those things out into the business, some we may hold back until the right time um, and then we come together just as a team to have a retrospective to look at how we've um, gone through the last period and, uh, and then we go back into planning and so that's, that's our two-week cycle. Uh, now, add, the Scrum is just one of the frameworks uh, that we use, but I hope it gives a flavour of what it's like. And I presume it's something like this that you are looking for. Um, but whatever it is you're doing, you need to be really clear on why you're going to do it. You know, maybe it's because you're trying to deliver more work in a shorter period of time. Maybe it's about quality. Maybe it's about delighting your customers. Maybe it's about the return on investment. Maybe it's about employee well-being, but really know why you are wanting to do Agile. And I guess I wish I wish I had considered that when we started out. I can answer it retrospectively. I mean, it was about that embedding of change, but I wish I'd gone with that intent in the first place. 
So make sure you know why you want to do it and that will shape up how you go about doing the Agile. So we're going to have a poll now. I'm going to ask you where you are with Agile and the poll's going to come up on the screen in a moment um, and uh, that'll tell me whether I've got the, the right presentation in front of me today. So if you just select one of the following uh, options, maybe it's something you've not considered at all, maybe you are considering it, maybe you're in those early stages of adopting Agile, maybe it's something you've done for a while, it's that ongoing maturity, or interestingly, maybe you've tried and, and stopped. So thank you, Peter. And responses are definitely coming in very quickly. Um, we've got close to 150 people with us today and we're, we're on the 72 completion rate at the moment. I won't ruin the results as they come in, but it's a it's a close close call between two two potential answers. So I'll let it get just above eighty percent, and then I'll I'll share the results. Okay. Excellent. So we've just gone past the eighty percent completion rate. So I'll just share the results, uh, and they're shown on screen. So early stages is at forty percent considering at 36 percent ongoing maturity 16 percent not considered eight percent and one percent tried and stopped okay thank you that's uh, that's really interesting um so it seems like i've got the right presentation in front of me i'd love to know that that one percent maybe that's a, a chat for some other time because uh, it's always inter interesting to know where the challenges are okay so um as we approach the question of using Agile, it seems obligatory that we've got to come up uh, and share a slide, something like this. Um, the waterfall versus Agile debate. Um, you know, whether you follow those sequential steps in a project or whether it's a cycle of constantly adapting to what is around you. But I think this is a complete, it leads us down the wrong path totally. Now let me illustrate this with an example. My daughter loves snowboarding. Um, and I've learned a good way to wind her up is to call it skiing. Um, now you may naively think it's just one ski or two, but I'm told it's two very different things. It's a different sport, it's a different technique, different technology, shots, publications, terminology, even the way people speak and the language they use and what they speak about and how they dress. It's actually two very different cultures. And even though they, they go down the same slopes, um, they're two very different things. It's, it feels like a sense of belonging to one group or the other. And sometimes that seems the same with waterfall and agile. You know, it's different approaches, terminology, technology, uh, conferences, associations, and even the way people speak, um, of what they speak about, and even the way they dress when they come into the office. But they both deliver value. Um, and yet there seems to be these two cultures. Now, when I was growing up, it was the same. I was really into mountain biking and there was these two camps uh, in the same with cycling. But if you look at it now, oh, I'm sorry, I've clicked my slides there. If you look at it now, actually cycling's like this great big spectrum of all these different types of bikes. Um, and it isn't just two cultures. Um, it's all really mixed up, the, the terminology, the technology, the clothing, uh, the cultures, and actually many cyclists have many types of bikes. I, um, and it, it, was always, it was probably always there, but maybe we didn't notice. And, and I think the same is true with Waterfall and Agile. The two things not only coexist, but they're actually different things, and they can be combined. And we shouldn't just think we're in one camp or the other. You can take a traditional waterfall approach and you can add all sorts of agility into it. And in a short while, Natalie's going to give us a, a great example of that. You just have to look at the Agile Manifesto and Principles. Now, this slide is way busier than I normally put up on a screen. and My colleagues are going to laugh at me for putting this up. Um, but I've just put it up for illustration purposes. If you want to look at these, just Google Agile Manifesto and the Principles and, and it will come up. Um, it helps if you change the word software to product, uh, as I've done here, and then it applies to any type of project. The manifesto is in white, uh, the blue and green is the principles, and if you look at them, many of them could completely apply to um, a waterfall project, and some of them 
partly apply. Yes, some of them, yep, yeah, not quite right. But these things can coexist. Uh, and the same is true of many of the techniques uh, that you use in Agile. It works the other way too. Um, you know, so you can take an Agile project, like we've got a large program um, using Agile, but we have traditional risk management techniques within that. And we use the right terminology that comes from risk management. Um, but then we put a bit of Agile on top of it. We have this burn down chart, as we call it, where we can see how the risks track over time and each color represents the month they were raised. So we can see if the risks are reducing, but also where the new risks are coming in. And also our risk register is completely open to anybody in the program. Anybody can see it, anybody can edit it. So we've got that agile perspective of being open and transparent. So that's just one example of how you can bring waterfall thinking into um, some agile projects. You know, this debate of the two cultures can lead us down the wrong path. And it's something that I have to remember myself. You know, I can see myself that in order to make the change to Agile, I've really highlighted the contrast. I've created a different culture. I've ensured it does look and feel different. And maybe that's led to some unnecessary resistance from some. Although I hope none of my colleagues are listening to this and hear, hearing me admit that. But let's come back to this thought. Where, where do you start? Where do you start with Agile? Well, I strongly believe that you already have started. And I call it unintentionally Agile. And normally when you look before you did Agile, you can see many of the things um, which were Agile, which we consider Agile. Um, and some people just call it common sense. It's what, what sensible people would do. And so there's, there's many um, techniques out there. If I just put up this slide here, um, you can have a glance at some of those, but the, these are a whole load of things that people would do in, um, in an agile environment, but you may have done them before you did anything that you called it agile. Um, they're actually just good practice, um, and it can be applied to many different types of projects. And it's like, you know, if you're on a train and you arrive at the train station and it somehow looks like the train station you left behind, it's, it's very familiar. Um, there's lots of all the same kind of things. Yes, it's different, but it's quite familiar. And hopefully with Agile, you can see that, that there is some things which are actually just familiar because ultimately we're still delivering projects with the same kind of risks and the same people and the same products. We're just doing it in a slightly different way. But there is a warning here because if you just think it's just a bunch of old stuff with a new name, you're going to miss the point. Um, Agile does give it a name. It isn't just a, a loose collection of approaches. Actually, Agile really sets out some boundaries, some clarity, some expectations, and it's a, a more specific way of working. Um, and there's a whole lot of frameworks that really add to it, and they, they make it a lot more specific, um, and they set out different roles and ways of working. So some of it is different and perhaps counterintuitive, and some of it's very familiar. Um, just one example of something that can be quite different, um, planning it often comes up. We tend to plan very differently in agile projects. It tends to be very high level. We build it around the user uh, value. It's a sequence of releases. We, we use techniques like relative estimating. And with something like Scrum, we plan every two weeks and we plan every day on a 15 minute call. So we're doing loads of planning, we just do it in a different way. Um, we don't even have a planner role because we believe the whole team should be involved in planning. And it isn't just a technique, it's you have to know why we're doing it differently. You know, we're planning for an environment where there's lots of unknowns um, and that's where Agile is really strong. So Agile, it brings in things that are familiar as we had on the earlier screen, what I call unintentionally Agile and then it adds some very different things with a very definite way in which we should do them. Um, but it really depends what aspects of Agile you're really drawing on. So if you want to start off, you know, where are you going to start from? Getting the roles right is correct, and it depends what framework you're going to use. Um, 
I was going to talk more about each of these, and then I thought, actually, I better slim it down a bit. There's plenty written about those those governance roles, because you really do need governance. It's not that Agile doesn't have governance, it's slightly different. Those roles that set the direction, you know, for example, in Scrum, we use a product owner, and there's very specific things about what they do. And also the, what are called here the building roles, the, the developers, the people that actually build the work. One of the things I've noticed and try and reinforce is that actually this is hierarchical, um, isn't of lesser importance in the other roles because these are the people that create the value. In fact, you could say we want our best people to be the people who are actually developing uh, the work. That's where the value is created. So there's lots of good material on those types of roles, but I want to focus on the last one, the coach, because that to me is the one that, that makes the biggest difference as you start off. It really unlocks getting all the other roles right. And in it, as I say, I think it really helped us. Um, I think even if you were doing, you know, a, a waterfall process, even if you were doing something like Prince2, actually having somebody who really knows that, who could coach you in it, would be valuable. But it's especially true of Agile as you learn new ways of working uh, to make sure you follow the best practice, to make sure the team's working effectively together, to make sure they're removing the, the blockers, the impediments that get in the way. Um, now, you really have to do tests to get the right people in. I've got an interview technique I use when I interview scrum masters and agile coaches. I just fire a whole load of agile knowledge questions at them. And it's not so much whether they get it right or wrong. It's actually the way they answer, the way they express their knowledge and their understanding. You can get a real sense of the depth of how much uh, they get it. But if you can get the right coach or scrum master, it really helps. Um, and I allow them to, to give me a hard time I am to keep challenging us to push me forward and push others to challenge our thinking. And after five years, they still do that. And I still learn every day. And I think it really is that advice that you get day to day, which really helps. It, it, it gives you help as you, as you tackle issues rather than go, just going in a training course and trying to remember what you learned. And over time, as a team, you get more and more self-sufficient. And certainly that's what we've done is we've got more and more employees that really get this and know how to drive it in the business. So I haven't told you yet about the projects we've used it on. Um, and most of these are business change projects. I've chosen lots of things with lots of good acronyms. So you have no idea what they are. But hopefully it gives you a flavor of what we've learned. Um, our first project back in January 2016 was PPD, a big process in the business. Um, and it's, you know, we made all the classic mistakes on this. Um, it, was, uh, <laughs> it was an interesting project. It was very incremental. We, we had set things we were going to do every sprint, but we didn't really get the idea of the iterations going until after it. Um, but one of the brilliant moments towards the end that I distinctly remember is our Agile coach gave us a choice. He says, look, you know, we're, we're running out of time here and, and the budget. Um, we can either stop here and we've got all the value we've delivered. Or we can go for another month and we can deliver this extra feature. Or we can go for three months and you'll get all of these features you wanted. And we actually had a genuine choice. And we've never had that before. It's normally an inevitability that you have to spend more money. But we had a three-way choice. We could decide what to do. Um, CCAT was a short project, a carbon tool. Um, and that's the first one we did without any outside contractor help. Uh, we did it ourselves. Uh, we got a key manager on board with Agile. Uh, and it gave me the confidence that we could do it ourselves. Uh, BIM, I've called out. Um, longest running Agile project we've had. Um, and that really gave me confidence in planning. And um, we used a technique called user story mapping. In fact, I've got here, we were all reading this book by Jeff Patton, user story mapping at the time. Um, and that plan that they came up with over three years ago still stands, stands true today. So that gave me a lot of confidence in um, agile planning. Um, Tom's, it was magical and it just really worked. It was that moment when we used agile for something that we'd been stuck with for 10 years and hadn't quite got delivered. And in nine months, they made a tremendous effort. It really focused the team. People really had to commit 
to the project, but it brought that focus and it delivered. And we had a delighted manager, um, really fantastic. Limbs, um, it wasn't a project at all. It was actually getting a business as usual team in our laboratory to manage this critical bit of software working in an agile way. And it really re-energized the team. It was fantastic. Um, Invercani, Natalie's going to tell you about it in a moment, and Alan's going to tell you about EMTR. But each one of these projects taught us something. Um, we had some failures too, um, but they all create moments. We learned, it's, it kept us going, uh, and it excites me, remembering them and what we learned from each one. So as you adopt Agile, notice those turning points, the good and the bad, and keep moving forward, keep learning and adapting. Okay, where should we use Agile? Now, we've mostly used the Scrum framework. We've used a bit of DSDM. Uh, we moved to Scrum because it was more flexible. We use a bit of uh, Kanban, and we now use a uh, scaled Agile framework, SAFE. Um, but there's plenty of sources out there as to what type of framework uh, you can use. I'm gonna give you two bits of advice. Um, and the first, that if you're going to use a framework, is to use it properly to really learn why it's set out like it is and really try and follow it properly. And that's where a coach um, can really help. Um, and continually improve how you do it. You know, have that cycle actively work on improve how you, how you use it. And then as you get more comfortable and as you learn why you do it, then you can start to adapt um, some of the, the techniques and so on and bring things in from elsewhere. So that's the first thing, but do try and follow it properly when you first start using it. The second is to go and read about the Kinevin framework. I am, that's spelt with a F, C-Y-N-E-F-I-N. -E uh, Kinevin framework is absolutely fantastic. There's a great Harvard Business Review article on this. I am back from 2007, and it really helps me understand Agile better and where it applies. And I won't go through all the detail, but there is simple work in Agile applies to an extent, but that's just work you can just tell people to go and get on and do with it. And it's fairly, you know, it's highly proceduralized and they, they know what they're doing. Complicated work is where you really need professionals and experts. Um, you know, for us, it's like having, you know, really good engineers who know how to design and build things. Um, and Agile can apply in that scenario. You can really use it. Um, complex is where Agile really thrives. Um, when actually you could bring in a world expert, they still couldn't tell you exactly the outcomes you're going to get. And you have to really adapt to the circumstances. And chaos, well, we don't actually see too much chaos because we normally try and get it back into the complex or the complicated zones. Um, but the top two, Agile is absolutely fantastic for them. So go read up about the Kinevin framework. Right, um, design and construction. I'm gonna hand over to Natalie. Um, because one of the most exciting steps we have taken, we have taken agile thinking and applied it to some of our design and construction projects. And as a civil engineer, that was really exciting for me. And the work of some of the team, Ishbel, Richard, and Natalie, really made that happen. So I'll pass over to you, Natalie. Hi, Peter. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Uh, yeah, I'm Natalie Lissell Stoner, Scrum Master for a construction design team at Scottish Water. We are currently on site upgrading the Invercani Water Treatment Works in Aberdeenshire and that photograph that you see in the middle there, that's the site there. The investment um, here will improve water quality and resilience to deliver 63 million litres of drinking water per day to the surrounding area. And a project of this size is estimated to cost over £55 million. And traditionally, a project of this size and complexity is forecasted to complete the design package in roughly 29 months, which then allows construction to begin on site. Scottish Water and its engineering delivery partner, however, had great ambition to get Invercani's design package and get on site in as little as 11 months. So that's 18 months ahead of the traditional forecast. And as Peter um, advised uh, earlier, it's really important to understand why you're applying Agile. And for this, um, it was to get on site in as little as 11 months. And so 
in 2018, Number Canny became Scottish Water's first contract with a delivery partner to commit to an accelerated project timeline with the coaching and guidance from an Agile Scrum Master and Agile Business Analyst. So if we fast forward 11 months later, and well, we weren't on site, but we're still very proud that we did get on site in 13 months. So that's still 16 months ahead of the traditional forecast. But not only that, we also gained a lot more. We gained a newfound respect, trust and understanding for individuals and interactions, their value and expertise. And we also deciphered how to simplify a complex programme of work into repeatable objects that could be executed at a sustainable pace. And I'll talk a bit more about that onto the next slide. The key to getting on site in that accelerated time was focus and commitment. My early introductions to the project team revealed very common project frustrations. And so I wasn't as scared because construction was very new to me. Um, but what I was hearing was very common to IT and digital projects that I'd worked on previously. The priority of the work is not understood or visible. Information sharing is delayed or not shared at all. Not knowing who's doing what and when and too many emails. A key adaption then from the team was simplifying the work and making it visible. This created the much needed focus. A construction programme of work is very complicated and jargon heavy and so the team collectively simplified the work to be done by identifying small key objectives that are required for a design package. These objectives were then ordered and prioritised with any typical impediments, risks and opportunities noted. And then, as Peter had described um, previously, on a fortnightly basis or per sprint, the team would pull those simplified pieces of work onto a visible Kanban board. We use Trello and they commit to a plan together to achieve those simplified pieces of work within that two week time box. The visual work plan and that openness was a really big adjustment and learning curve for the team and it did take time. It took quite a bit of time to get into that rhythm, but what was key to success was the change in behaviours to transparency and openness about what you could or could not achieve, or simply asking from your team what you need. And then every morning, the team inspects the digital Kanban board to organise their day together, calling out impediments, blockers, or calling out one another when a promise is delayed. And so we poke a lot of fun, we have fun, but we get the job done and all individuals are respected and trusted to pull and commit to the work that they achieve that day. At the, at the end of every two weeks, we take pause with our stakeholders, we review what was done and maybe some of what was not done. We openly review this with our key stakeholders and in return, we get their feedback and input empowers the team to make decisions, to remove blockers, issues or anything slowing us down. Then as a team only, we take pause and inspect how we, how we executed the work in the past two weeks, what was good, what was bad, what could we do better? Um, and this requires a lot of courage from the team. Um, and it's in these conversations that they identify and mitigate the most effective behaviour changes that enable us to be a self-sufficient team. In summary, it's not absolutely agile framework. It's neither exactly Scrum or Kanban or anything else that you've seen. But what is important is that we live and breathe the five values as much as we can. So that's commitment, respect, openness, courage and focus. These are the five scrum values. And the best feedback I've had is from the team. Um, they believe this is the best project they've ever worked on. And knowing that they are so motivated to continue to challenge and adapt Scottish Water inside and outside of Invercanny for the good of its customers and employees, it's proof that we're not absolutely doing typical Agile, but we are being typically Agile and we're challenging the organisation to adapt. So I'm happy to take any of your questions at the end. Um, and back to Peter. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Natalie. It really has been an exciting project to hear about and hear uh, the work that's gone on there and how we've applied some of that agile thinking in. Um, 
and it is naturally intimated there it's it's going beyond just doing the mechanism of agile but it's actually that that being agile that's really important for us um, now i just wanted to share with you i am um, a diagram i've drawn up i've got this interest in systems thinking and i'm trying to learn as a as i go here on how to effectively use it as a technique but the other day i was thinking about this because we've got real desire to promote agile to get those benefits out of it not just for the sake of doing it but we really want to get uh, some things out of it and using some systems thinking i started to think out well what we do is we we do training courses we get people moving into agile projects and um, they follow that mechanism and then we get some benefits and that's what we call a reinforcing loop if we just keep doing that more and more we'll get we'll get more and more benefits but countering that we have this balancing loop that is when people see right okay we're following the steps we're doing it we're doing what you tell us that you people perceive that we've arrived and it slows down the amounts that drive to really get the most out of agile and if that's all you get on agile then yeah that, that, that can be a reason for people going oh well is it really giving us anything didn't give us all the savings we thought didn't speed things up as much as we thought and so there is a risk that you're just going through the motions of it the mechanism what we really want to happen is for people to intrinsically understand why we're doing this and this leads around to the root of what we call being agile uh, whether that's from the initial training or whether it's just by using it for a while uh, they really start to grasp what it is and we've seen more and more people take this journey it does take time and each one of those double lines indicates that it could take months or years to have people go down that, that journey but more and more people start to be agile they really know why we're doing it in a certain way and that is what builds that long-term embedment and hopefully that becomes a really strong reinforcing loop that that's what drives the behavior uh, in the business people passionately following the agile approach because it, they really get why i am um, and off the back of that uh, we then get the full benefits of agile the more people you have going around that loop you really start getting those longer term benefits and yes you know people will then say okay we feel like we've arrived but that reinforcing loop is really powerful now i've overly simplified that i am as you have to do with system thinking but this is what really gets me um going and it's what we've got to closely measure because you've got to measure to see are you just following the mechanism or are you getting that indication you're actually getting people who really understand why you're doing it in that way because that's that's where you really get the, the long term and full benefits from it so one last thing we wanted to share with you scaling agile um you know we've we've had a long list of lessons we've learned um over the past five years or so but we've had a real big challenge over the last year because we've taken you know discrete um agile projects and we've said actually we've got a major 10-year transformation program to do and um, how do we use agile in a way that really connects people together that they really collaborate on a single product that takes a lot of people and i'm going to pass over to alan to tell this tale okay thanks peter and uh, hello everybody i'm alan crilly uh, asset manager with scottish water so as peter said uh, i want to take the next couple of minutes to explore with you how we have set ourselves up to deliver a uh, or deliver and coordinate multiple activities across a, a long-term program. Um, it's the asset management transformation journey that I'm going to describe. And to give a little bit of context around that, it's the program where uh, Peter, Natalie, and myself spend the majority of our time. And it's uh, setting Scottish Water up to make better investment decisions. So that's uh, how, where, and when do we spend our customers' money on our assets, um, refurbishing, replacing, repairing them. And by assets, I mean our treatment facilities, our pipes and pumps, everything that's needed to maintain the safe water and wastewater services for the people of Scotland. The programme is a 10-year journey, and it's made up of nine interconnected work streams. Uh, and those are the, the coloured boxes on the, on the uh, slide there. I'm not going to go into each of those boxes and what, what we're doing within them, but uh, suffice to say that they're all very much reliant on each other. 
Uh, if we are to deliver the overall outcomes of this programme, we need all of those work streams to move forward together in a coordinated manner. And it's the dependencies between them um, that will deliver the, the real value. And the dependencies actually mean that we can't have any of those uh, work streams progressing out of kilter with the rest of them. If they go too fast, they'll not have the support and functions around them that the other work streams will provide. And if they go too slow, they'll be holding back the development of the other work streams. If you could click on for me, Peter. So you can imagine with, uh, with that amount of uh, work happening, there's a great potential for it all to get pretty messy pretty quickly. Uh, complex relationships, multitasks being worked on by multi-people, multi uh, competing priorities, dependencies, risks being uh, not understood or not shared. And then there's somebody in the middle uh, trying to make sense of it all. And uh, though my camera's not on today, it's not far off the back of my head that you're, you're looking at there. So what did we do to try and address this? Um, again, Peter, please. Uh, we set up a framework around it. Um, and as Peter said earlier on, uh, there are lots of frameworks out there. Uh, this time we've borrowed heavily from the SAFE, Scaled Agile Approach. Uh, and as we began to understand what SAFE is there to do, we've tweaked it uh, a little bit to just make it work for what we are trying to do. And in essence, what that framework does, it enables the transparency needed across everything the program is doing so that everyone in it can have sight of what's happening. And it encourages the, the collaboration needed to give uh, each work stream and the overall program the best overall chance of success. And uh, how, how this works then is, uh, is twofold. So we have set the program up and we've got a rhythm to which the program works to. So the, the setup is represented on the slide there and within it we've got layers of activities. Along the top there we've got a guiding group that holds the overall vision of what we're trying to achieve long term and what the right steps are to, uh, to take towards that over the next year or two. And this group works very closely with the business leaders. Those leaders whose areas will be directly affected by the changes that we're making or will be involved in the changes themselves. And this is where the long-term aspiration of the program crashes into the day-to-day -day reality of, uh, of the business. Down the left-hand side, um, we've got a small core team. And uh, this core team is made up primarily of three functions. We have uh, the system architecture, and that's responsible for defining and communicating a shared technical and architectural vision of where we're going. We've got product management, uh, which is responsible for defining and supporting the building of uh, desirable, feasible, and viable products that meet the customer's needs. And the other role there is the release train engineer, which is similar to Scrum Master, but at a program level, a servant leader and coach. Um, and the RTE's major responsibilities are to facilitate the program events and assist the teams in delivering value. And then in the middle, um, Again, as Peter alluded to earlier, this is where the real work happens. This is where the work streams come together. And when the products, processes, and behavioral changes that are needed to, uh, to get us to where we're going are initiated and then integrated into the business. Each of the colored circles there represents a work stream. And uh, yeah, it's only getting bigger and more complicated what we're trying to do there. Uh, each of the work streams coordinates its own works. But the coloured groupings that you see are set up so that the right level of collaboration can happen with like-minded watch streams. And then the overall structure is set up to get that cross-program uh, cross collaboration and transparency happening. And on the right-hand side, you'll see that there's some temporal um, groupings as well. And these can be stood up and stood down uh, around particular issues or particular products that we recognise would benefit from having additional focus around it. And with that structure in place, we need to get them working together in a way that the information will flow through the programme. And to make this work, we've got a, um, a rhythm to which the programme works to. And the rhythm's based off that two-week rhythm uh, of Scrum that we talked about earlier. And from the programme level, the highlights of that starts with uh, every two weeks, we have a review session for each of the work streams uh, table what they've been working on for the last two weeks and look to get feedback from uh, others within the program or the business itself on, on what they've produced and 
how they can improve what they're doing going forward. We've also got a product owner event, which is the uh, coordinating member of those development teams. They get together every four weeks and uh, share the issues that are common to them, uh, share concerns and plan out what's, what's happening next. And then the big one for us is uh, on a quarterly basis, um, we get the whole programme together and invite everybody to hear what is happening and what is planned to happen going forward. This, uh, this event is really key to getting that shared understanding and uh, the progress that's been made. And within that uh, programming increment event, everybody's got a voice. So everybody from directors down to development team members can voice their opinion on what's going on and suggest the way that we can move forward. And this is also where we celebrate success of what's been delivered. Um, the real fun on this over the last year, year and a half or so since we've been up and running is uh, if you read the books, these should be in-person events. We've obviously, uh, with the world as it is today, had to run it all digitally, uh, which has given us a whole set of uh, new challenges and there's probably an entire event we could dedicate to, to that. But um, that's for another day. So I'll leave it there and pass back over to Peter. Okay, thank you, Alan. Yes, it really has been uh, testing us to scaled agile to synchronize all those changes. I am um, to make sure everybody's working in an agile way, but also not being overly prescriptive, you know, allowing people a bit of flexibility to work the way that suits their team. Um, but it's been quite exciting. We've learned a lot. So just to conclude then, um, to be agile or not to be, as I said in the title, that's not really the question. I think everybody should have some element of agile, you know, whether it be a lot or a little, um, maybe it's a full-on framework, I am, but maybe none of those are appropriate, like we've seen with the Invercani project. Maybe it's uh, using some techniques or practices. Maybe it's uh, the daily planning calls, the frequent retrospectives, the ongoing customer insight, or using some Kanban techniques. Um, or maybe it's actually just taking some of those agile principles and really seeing them all the way through. You know, one of those principles says, build projects around motivated individuals, Give them the environment and support they need and trust them to get the job done. Surely that applies to all projects um, that we do. So yes, there is a risk if you adopt Agile. You may upset some people who have to work in a different way and you will make some mistakes. Um, but it isn't life and death. You know, bring some Agile in and your work life will be so much better. Right, so we're going to open up for some questions. Yeah, well, uh, thanks very much, Peter, uh, Natalie and, and Alan. That's been uh, really interesting and insightful. Um, we do have a, a number of questions. Um, I think I'll kick off uh, with one myself. Um, how did you get leadership support to use Agile within Scottish Water? Yeah, it's um, that's always a challenge. I am, um, so my screen's just frozen. Can you hear me okay? Yeah. Good. Okay, that's fine. My, my video is frozen as the way it does these days. Um, yeah, getting leadership support. We were very fortunate. Um, we had, I am, um, right, I think that's just, <laughs> okay, sorry, that threw me, my screen completely changed. Um, very fortunate that my uh, manager was very supportive of us allowing, you know, fresh ways of thinking. Uh, to come in and he gave us the space to be able to do it and also the way we were governed um, you know we had resources that we could use for whatever change projects we needed to do so without the need to get uh, the resources for specific projects so we had a bit of freedom that we could start and we started it fairly quiet and then as we went um, we slowly got leaders um, in involved uh, and we built it up and then it started generating more and more attention and we got more and more leaders involved um, as we went. So, you know, five years down the line, lots more in the business, lots more people are talking about Agile and using Agile. And it's like, well, it's great because we've been using it for five years and here's how we've done it. Here's what we've learned and here's how we can help. Um, so we built it slowly. Um, that's how we got the leaders on board. Okay, oh, that's uh, really good. 
Um, looking at some of the other questions that have come in, uh, Ahmad has uh, asked, can you please share some points from the interview questions you'd mentioned earlier in your presentation? Yes, so the way I do it, um, if you look at something like the Scrum Guide, uh, if, you're, if it is Scrum you're going to use, you can follow Scrum Guide and you can just come out with some questions on that, on basic knowledge, or you can take um, some questions from things like the Agile Manifesto or Principles. So just go and ask basic questions that a, a good Scrum Master would know. Um, and as I say, it's a way they talk about it. Um, if you ask a, an Agile um, coach with lots of experience, you know, when, when did people first start using Agile? They'll just, <laughs> they'll just talk. Um, they'll talk freely and excitedly and so on. And you, hopefully they get the answer right. But it's the way they talk. So it's just basic knowledge questions. But it really, I mean, it makes them sweat a bit, but it really helps uh, understand where they're coming from. Okay, thanks for that. I hope that answers Ahmed's question. Um, there was also one here from uh, Sarah. She was asking, uh, regarding Agile in construction, were you still following Reba? R-I-B-A. Uh, now remind me what Reba is. I, um, I think that's, uh, is that not uh, Architects? Yes. Um, so I'm so, sure if that uh, applies to, um, to the yeah. construction projects you're working in. Yes, 20 years in the water industry. Um, so, I mean, the, the project did have to follow really strict governance. We have a program of, you know, 600 million a year. Um, it's funny, we're a public company. We are really heavily governed. We've got really tight specifications, especially on water treatment. All of that still applies. The work that's done is the same work, but the way people go about the work is different. So yeah, standards and all those kind of things and governance, yeah, they're all still there. We still need that robust uh, nature. So hopefully that answers. Um, there's a great example of agile thinking being used on building projects. Um, I met a chap, it's a long story, but the short bit is two billion pound skyscraper in London. I think it's the second tallest skyscraper in London. They used a, an approach called cluster uh, techniques. Um, the chap himself doesn't know much about agile, but the approach is full of agile. Um, that's a really good example of a good architectural project that used some agile thinking. Okay, and um, following on from that, uh, it's kind of a, a supplementary question. Ian is asking here, so can Agile be used within the, the contract structure of NEC, uh, which is very typical for, uh, for uh, construction projects? So it's a yes, but there is a real challenge. Uh, we don't go into it there, but the contractual barrier can get in the way. Um, and maybe Natalie wants to come in here. So yes, you've got two parties and they've got a contract between them. In fact, you've got more than two parties and you've got a number. And yeah, it takes a bit of work and discussion. Um, but once you get beyond that and into the day-to-day -day planning and sharing with each other, you can make it work. Um, but you can build that trust. Um, I don't know, Natalie, if there's anything you want to add to that. <clears throat> yeah, I think you talked earlier about... Um about stakeholders and management support, I think getting that permission is obviously the first thing you need to do when you're working um, in these complex environments. And one thing with the construction environment, that is what held us back. We did have permission um, within the core team and we had it in the contract, but there are certain peripherals where, yeah, you can't, you can't go beyond and you don't have permission and, and that's where you're restricted. Um, and that's, you have to work around that. And so it, that's why it's not the perfect example of Agile Scrum or Kanban, but you still can challenge um, and improve like we did. And I think that aspect of transparency as well is really key to Agile. So be open and honest about these barriers that are there and call them out for what they are, don't hide them. Say, look, we can't share this and this is why, but here's what we can share. And also we've got, um, you know, we've got alliances that last for, you know, six years at least. And that really helps because there's an ongoing development. There's a whole massive program being delivered. So you've got an ongoing relationship with those, um, those partners. Okay. Um, 
Samantha has asked three questions here, um, all on a similar theme. So I'll see if I can try and uh, summarize them into one question. Um, uh, let's start with how did you record and track risks in, in JIRA? I, I don't know, or G-I-R-A, that's not something familiar to me. Yes, uh, it's, it's a quite a common I, um, a tool used in Agile. So we don't actually use it. We, been using Trello mostly and then um, Azure DevOps, Microsoft's Azure DevOps, but we don't track risks in there. Um, we've simply got a standalone risk tracker. We've actually got a little app we run. We use a Power BI report um, to interpret that and um, we use good old Excel to create our burn down charts. So we, we do it differently. We've not used okay. Jira. I don't know, Natalie, you've used Jira in the past, but I don't know if you've used it for risks. I can't remember, it was a long time ago, sorry. <laughs> um, yeah, because uh, Samantha was saying, uh, yeah, uh, how do you record and track risks in Jira? It, it, uh, is it easy to transfer from RAID, Log, XLS into Kanban and report to Steerco? Um, that sounds like a lot of agile uh, jargon yeah. to me. Yes, we, we just tend to use I am a more traditional risk register, but it's a way we use that risk register that's different. We keep it really transparent. We have the burn down and we don't use those tools uh, specifically for it. OK. Um, uh, what else uh, so was there? Ursula here has asked a question. Can you confirm the five values used by Scottish Water? I think you'd had a slide earlier in your presentation where you were talking yeah, about five are. scrum values. Now, Natalie, you're really good with the scrum values. Do you want to tell us uh -huh. what you Danny? <laughs> yeah, so we've got commitments. So we are a collective. We commit to achieving goals together um, to help us move away from that kind of us and them speak. Uh, respect, it's self-managing, working individuals who are respected and trusted. I pull the work we commit to achieving. Um, I understand what my teammates are working to achieve and why. Openness, um, we're honest. When something doesn't fit, when it cannot be done on time or at all, we sh and we share our successes and pains. Courage, um, striving for the best for our customers, we challenge the norm, um, and focus. This is a big one for me, focus. We break down and prioritise work um, for what makes a sense for critical a works transparency and sustainability so that's the five and you'll find them on the scrum guide okay thanks very much natalie um and i think we probably have time for uh, one last question um ahmad has asked a follow-up question uh, he was asking is there any relationship uh, between agile and risk management um Yes. Good question. <laughs> uh, I think I think they're two the two different things. I, I use risk management as an example of something which is used a lot in waterfall projects, and there's very you know defined mm. ways in which you should do it, and there's very defined terminology. And I think you know my key point is that we can use that in waterfall. That's great, and you can use it in agile. It's not a problem to use it just because we're we're being agile doesn't mean that we're not going to good, use good risk uh, tools because we're still managing a lot of costs um, mm. we still have risks. Now the way Agile um, minimises risk is different. Um, you may look at the biggest riskiest items and you may tackle them early on and look to reduce risk in a different way so your risk profile can be different um, if you're doing Agile properly and you're you know you're trying to show your work to the users and stakeholders much more frequently um, and in a way, you're really reducing the risks that something won't work. For business change, your biggest risk is that what you deliver doesn't give you the outcomes at all. Um, with construction projects, it's much easier because you know that the thing you're going to build is going to work because we've built hundreds of them before. We know how to do them. But with business change, there's a huge risk that it just might not change the business. People might not do it that way. Um, and so delivering frequently with business change helps you reduce risk. But yeah, I see them as two separate things. Okay, now well, that's very good. Um, and I think that probably draws things to a close um, because we're, we're coming up to the, uh, the hour.
and uh, it looks like we've answered all the questions that uh, that people have posted. So I think all that remains is to um, uh, to give my thanks to Peter and Natalie and Alan for sharing very enthusiastically um, their uh, passion for Agile and uh, I hope that it's been interesting to everyone who's been watching. So thanks very much. Thank you everybody for joining us. Thank you.